You're listening to Deliberate Living. The podcast that inspires, empowers, and encourages listeners to live life more authentically. My name is Holly Priestley, and I'm a nomad, coach, creator, and outdoors woman. And I'm Beers, a vagabond, joy artist, permissionary, and story breaker. We explore different ways people choose to ditch the prescribed life we've all been sold and live on their terms. Finding freedom and happiness however they choose. Hello, hello. Welcome to another episode of the Deliberate Living Podcast. I am one of your hosts, Nathan Beers. I'm the other host, Holly Priestley. And this week, we are having a really cool conversation with Holly. We are learning all about her (laughs) adventures with running. So uh, I am not a runner. Uh, I, I ran a little bit in like like cross country in high school, but like it was fairly short run, especially compared to like what you do. So first, like, how the fuck did you get started running? (laughs) Uh, This is kind of a common question in, in both forms. How, how did I get started running? And then how would I recommend somebody else get started running? Um, My running journey is kind of non-traditional, which I think is pretty typical for most of my life. Um, <clears throat> I grew up with an ultra athlete as a parent. Um, my dad was always a runner growing up. He was always doing marathons and then ultra marathons and triathlons and quads. And like, he was just a machine. So that's what I grew up with. But and this is one of those scenarios where you grow up to be exactly like your parent. Uh, no, I think he's still more of a machine than I am. <laughs> um, but so I didn't do anything with that really. Like I didn't play sports as a kid, um, mostly because other kids were mean and I didn't want to get bullied, uh, but I got bullied anyway. So it's not like I saved myself any bullying. Um, but I didn't really like do much. I would exercise because I wanted to look a certain way, right? I would go to the gym because I wanted to look a certain way. In college, I played ultimate frisbee because it was fun. Um, because my my friends started a team that was like super beginner, super rec. So like it was just a super nice, like just way to play with your friends, you know, as an adult, because you can't like play once you're beyond like 10 or something relearning how to play has been like a journey in adulthood and maybe that should be a podcast episode it probably should so so for you is like literally beating your body into the pavement for hours on end is that is that play Uh, it can be I think it I think your mindset has more to do with whether something's play or not I I, okay I agree with that yeah yeah um (laughs) So yeah, I guess back to derailed, like yeah. playing ultimate Frisbee, like there's running involved in ultimate Frisbee, but it's a very different form of running. And like, uh, and then I stopped playing because it got competitive after college, even though it was still supposed to be like rec league stuff, long story longer. Oh, yeah. Um, I really, when I was 23, 22, I think I started training <clears throat> when I was 22, uh, I had, I was living in Denver and, um, there was a yarn store that I really liked and was like the cool place to hang out. And the women who like worked there <clears throat> and owned it, <coughs> excuse me, the women who worked there and owned it were very cool. So cool. The coolest. And I really wanted to be included into their tiny little click of coolness. And like one time when I was there, they mentioned that they were all going to run the Denver um, rock and roll half marathon. And I was like, okay, cool. I can do that. I can, I can run the half marathon. I want to be like, it was like, this is my initiation. I'll be part of your team. Let me be your friend. <laughs> so I signed up and I started running and training for that. Um, poorly. And at this point you hadn't really run other than. Yeah, not really. Okay. All right. So just yeah. jumping into a half marathon. Yeah, why not? To, to fit in with the cool knitting women. Yeah, I was 22. Okay. So, you know, I could do anything and I didn't know any better. Yeah. 
<laughs> uh, and then over the course of training, like I gave myself injuries, but kept running anyway. And like, didn't like, didn't know how to train, didn't know how to do anything. <clears throat> and over the course of the training, all of the women gradually dropped out of the race and they were like, we're not going to run it anymore. They had, um, the day of the race, they had like knitting industry royalty coming to their shop and they didn't want to like miss the opportunity to hang out with this very famous person um, by running or like being sweaty. And I was like, well, I fucking paid a hundred dollars for this race. Like I'm doing it. Uh, so I ran it alone with, you know, a thousand other people. Did you um, feel left out? Do we need to do a story breaking session on this? <laughs> uh oh man it was I just wanted to be cool and included and I wasn't in any way and then and then I ran the race anyway because I paid a hundred dollars for it and that is a really good way for me to do things that I don't necessarily want to do is pay for them um and then I went to the yarn store after the race like wearing my finisher's medal and being like fuck yeah I did it and like nobody noticed me nobody said anything like it was nothing. And then I went home and like took a nap, I'm sure, because I was fucking exhausted. And then I didn't run again for like, oh no, that's not when I quit running. I signed up for another half marathon less than a year later. Um, and this time I did it with my dad. And so instead of wanting to be like accepted by the cool girls at the yarn store I wanted to run with my dad which was just another version of like please accept me mm -hmm. um because he is like I said an ultra athlete and the the second half marathon I signed up for was the Leadville heavy half and so uh it's a heavy half just means that it's more than a half instead of being 13.1 it was like 15 and a half um and I don't know if like y'all have type of perspective <laughs> slightly more than a half yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh and if you know anything about Leadville like you know it's at elevation like the town is at 10,200 feet oh wow and so that's where the race started and then it goes up Mosquito Pass so that's at 13.1 and for those who don't really know what's the significance of running at elevation Oh, there's just a lot less like oxygen and stuff, like the things that your body needs to oh, that, that, yeah. do the running. As you're like huffing and puffing and trying to get all that yeah. oxygen in to be able to run. There's just a lot less of it to access. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But yeah. And then there's like a certain elevation uh, where my stomach started getting like elevation sickness, altitude sickness. Um, and I really had to puke. But I could not because I have actively trained myself away from puking. And so I was just like hands and knees on the side of the course for like a way too long, just like trying to puke, but not puking and like just feeling like shit. And all these other runners are going by me and my dad's standing there like fucking do it or don't. What are we doing here? Come on, like just get it out. <laughs> and I finally did. And then I had like this burst of adrenaline. And I was like, all right, let's do it. <laughs> and we made it to the top of Mosquito Pass, like on adrenaline only, because I had just Yeesh. emptied my body of all of my fuel. And we get to the top and it's like super windy and I feel awful. And my dad's like, you have to eat something. Like you have to put fuel back in your body. Like we have to get back down. This is like the halfway point. And like, I mean, that whole race was, you know, it took me as long to finish that half marathon as it took him to finish a full marathon like it was not glamorous in any way shape or form yeah. and I, I remember like we finally got to the bottom and like I had a burst of energy right at the finish line which turns out is normal for me who knew um and like we were sitting around with our like finishers mugs filled with beer and like somebody a couple of people like recognized me and they were like oh my god you made it like they saw me <laughs> puking on the side of the course and like part of me was embarrassed and part of me was like I did <laughs> and after that I quit running <laughs> <laughs> okay so the story of how you started running is you quit the story of how I started is that I quit yes I started for the wrong reasons and I trained the wrong way 
and I did the thing anyway. And I got, you know, the, the finishers accolades. Um, and then I quit unsurprisingly because everything about it was wrong. (laughs) Fair. That's fair. And then you took how many years off before you decided to revisit this body torture exercise? (laughs) Um, probably seven ish years. I think I took seven years off because I started two years ago. Again, I started basically at the beginning of the pandemic before, like right before the pandemic became a thing. Very early 2020, I started running again. Gotcha. Why? Um, I wanted to have an activity that I didn't need a gym or a partner for. I wanted an activity that was just super easy and like take with a bowl from like living in the van and stuff. Yeah. Um, and I had a lot of friends who were doing it and I was like, well, I, you know, maybe I could do it with my friends, but like, really, I just wanted an activity that like I could do anywhere at any time with like no special gear and like no pre-planning and like no having to make sure the gym is open and you know because I was a climber for a long time and climbing became my passion in right. in the interim um and a lot of vanners climb a lot of climbers van and I still had a really 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 hard time meeting other climbers and like making climbing friends in the van and it just seems so I backwards because so often but like so many climbers are vanners and like, it seems like you see it on Instagram and like people are like, I'm vanning and I just met these amazing climbers. We're going to go climb. And like, I just could not make that happen for me. So I was like losing my physical abilities and like my, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like it was a thing. It was my thing. And I was and I was losing it like super slowly. And like, I was trying so hard not to, but I was like, I need some kind of activity. I need to be able to move my body and I need it to not be reliant on anybody else. Right. And so running is the easiest thing, which is fully air quoted. <laughs> like it's not actually, oh my God. Um, but that was what I believed. Like running will just be so easy. You just need a pair of shoes. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I think I've heard you mention before that running has been a lot more expensive than you expected it to be, which that blows my mind because yeah, like I thought you just need a pair of shoes and yeah. Yeah. So what's expensive? (laughs) Um, So Brandon Leonard, the guy behind Semi-Rad has a really good uh, comic or graph or, you know, he has an image about the expense of running um, okay. that I will definitely be sure to include when we publish this episode. Um, but basically, like, the more you run, the more money you spend on running. Like, the more miles you run, the more money you spend on running. The more hours you run, the longer you run. Like, the long, the longer you run, like in a in a moment, but also like over years. Um, so when I first started running, I was right. Like, all you need is a pair of shoes to get started. <laughs> And then, and then the longer you go, you're like, all right, I need a pair of shoes. I'm going to run. This is great. And then you reach a certain mileage or a certain time and you're like, okay, now I need to bring some water. All right, fine, whatever. I'll just have some shoes and a water bottle. And that's my running kit, neat, whatever. And then like, oh, then I'm going to need like some sunglasses for like the sunny days, or I need some layers for the cold days. Okay, fine, whatever. No big deal. I'll just get those things. And then you start running longer and longer distances. And then you need like fuel and to carry your fuel, which is running word for food to carry your food you need like a vest or a hip pack or like something else and then you know you might want to get a watch so that you know when you're supposed to be eating or like what your splits are and then you might need like it's just like it's kind of if you give a mouse a cookie like if you give (laughs) if you give a person running shoes then they might want a water bottle to go with it and once you give them the water bottle then they might need some way to carry the water bottle and if you give them some way to carry the water bottle then maybe they'll start carrying fuel and stuff it's a very just like ding 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 ding. like everything (laughs) builds on itself and then suddenly it's like oh my god and then with the running i'm doing now like i don't want the more you run the more you have to care about your your gear when i first started running you know, I'm only running like one or two miles, maybe three. It doesn't matter like what I'm wearing. 
but now that I'm running more and more and more, like I want to make sure my feet are protected. Like I have to spend more money on my shoes. Uh, the, the type Running of shoes, shoes you get are, go up more. Okay. All right. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. And then like now the miles that I'm doing now, I'm learning like, okay, at this mileage, I'm getting blisters in this way. So I have to have special socks to prevent the blisters that are happening there. But then after I run this many miles in those socks, then I have to change socks because those socks give me blisters in a new place. So I have to get new socks to cover the blisters. Like it's just... It's such a puzzle that the more you do it, the more you realize like, okay, this is wrong. Fix that. Okay. Now this is wrong. Fix that. <laughs> I'm trying to refrain from saying, well, where's it, where, where does this is wrong? Fix that begin. Uh, where does it begin? I mean, it, it's different for everybody. My my thought was 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 it begins with the the deciding to run, but <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> I'm kidding mostly. Mostly, uh, I'm a non-runner. <laughs> <laughs> so so, how much how much water how much fuel food do you carry with you like? Uh, Yesterday, I believe, was your weekly long run. How mm -hmm. how long is your long run, both in terms of distance and time? And what how much water and fuel do you take with you? Um, so the very unsatisfying short answer is it depends. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next question. Uh, <laughs> so I'm I'm right now while we're recording this, I'm training for my first 50k, um, which is a 31 mile race that I'm going to be running in May. And so my long runs are getting longer, not every week. Um, and I can definitely like dive super deep into my training plan if somebody wants me to, but I don't think that's what we need right now. Um, so my but... Jeep needs about a gallon and a half of gasoline to go that far. <laughs> so how much, how much does Holly need to, <laughs> to go that far? <laughs> Uh, so I don't know yet. Cause I haven't run 31 miles yet, but I'm going to guess that for me to go 31 miles, I'm going to need more than a gallon of water and Gatorade. Um, cause you have to get the electrolytes water by itself is not good enough. Once you start getting into the higher miles, um, and I carry water. It's fuel. okay. We still love you. No water is wonderful. I, I need both. I can't. I can't just have Gatorade on a run like that, but I also can't just have water. They are a team. They're a team. They're an electrolyte hydration team. <laughs> okay. right. um, so on my run yesterday, I did 10 and a half ish miles and that took me about two hours. I'd have to check my phone. Um, and I took two water bottles with me, but I didn't finish one of them. So I, I also am not like the best at hydrating and fueling yet. I'm still learning. I definitely under hydrate and under fuel, mm. um, which is not sustainable. So that's something like <clears throat> almost as much as I'm work. No, as much as I'm working on my miles every week and I'm working on my form and I'm working on my muscles. I'm also working on my stomach. Like running longer and longer distances like it's more than just about your legs it's yeah. more than just about your muscles it's more than just about stretching or any of that like your stomach shuts down um running like it's just, just it's a, like shaken or um it's a biological response to like the fight or flight thing and i think like when you're doing that kind of running your body is like well we need all of our energy to go to running so we are going to shut down any process that is not necessary right now and you know what's not necessary digesting so wow. that's not always true like if i could tell my body to keep digesting that would be great but i cannot <laughs> so the things that you put in your body while you're running you have to practice and like get yourself used to eating and drinking and like having caloric input while you're running so that your body can figure out 
it's partially you telling your body, like, I need to do this work with me here. And your body being like, okay, we don't like that. This is fine. We don't like that. We don't like that either. This is okay. <laughs> like there's certain things that I know that my body will just like give me a sour stomach over and just be like, nope, you can't have that. You can't eat that. We are not going to process that while you're running. And then I have other things that my body's like, fucking fine, fine. We will get you some kind of calories, but we don't like it. <laughs> it's not the easiest thing for me right now. <laughs> no, it doesn't sound like it. Like, well, and I remember like in those, no, I might've actually only been one season I ran cross country, but I remember like before races and stuff, we would, uh, we were encouraged to like the night before to eat pasta, uh, to get the carbohydrates and, and, and make sure our bodies had the fuel that we needed going in. Yeah. Do you do anything in particular to fuel up before you run and how long before your run does that intentional fueling for the run begin? And what do you fuel it with? All those questions. Yeah, good questions. All good questions. Um, for me, for my for my weekly runs, like my shorter runs during the middle of the week, I don't worry about a thing and I just go run. Um, for my like longer how, how runs- How long are those? Like your, your like everyday runs? My midweek runs are like six miles. So about an hour. Okay. Uh, my longer runs, anything that's going to be like two or more hours, um, I will make sure that I eat beforehand. And usually I just eat like a peanut butter and jelly, like sandwich or tortilla. Um, it's something that's super quick. That doesn't take me any time to make that I can eat while I'm getting dressed, while I'm putting my shoes on, while I'm like getting ready and collecting all of my gear for the day. Um, and then on my runs, I take a mixture of just like standard gummy bears and like the gummy, like electrolyte snacks that are like specifically for activities. Um, I don't necessarily need to spend all the money just on like activity gummies. <laughs> I can have regular gummies, um, but I do need, I do find that like when I mix them together, I get a better result. Interesting. Um, I, I had running. never heard of like gummies being used as a running thing. That fascinates me. I started using gummy bears uh, as activity fuel years ago, mostly for hiking. Um, and it took me a long time to, to admit it. Cause I wanted to like, want the, the cliff bars and the, you know, like the specialty right, right. foods. And I just don't like them. Uh, I don't, Same. I don't like the way they taste, which is not the point of why you're supposed to eat them, but they also like, don't make my stomach feel good. So I don't, really like them. And it took me a long time to be like, what do I actually want to eat while I'm hiking? Like, what, do, what does my body crave? And this is, this is a, actually something that still happens with running, I find. Um, but I, yeah, I don't want to digress too much. Uh, so when I was hiking, I was trying to eat all the fancy food that you're supposed to eat that you find at REI. And my body was like, bitch, we don't like this. Stop, give us something else. So I tried to listen to like, all right, well, what would you rather eat? And then the next time I went hiking, I brought the foods that previously my stomach was like, we would rather have this. And I just, again, it's just testing. It's constant testing. Does this work? Does this work? How do I feel on this? Um, and so I'm still doing that with running. It's just slightly faster. I'm not a very fast runner, yeah, but it's okay. a slightly faster than hiking. Just like mm, maybe a, a minute, a mile. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a very slow runner. <laughs> All right. So uh, another question, you had sent me some questions that uh, some of your Instagram followers had asked. And I think we've actually organically hit on most of these, but uh, one on here is how do you train in winter? And yeah. like when there's like, like I know that you've lived and run in a lot of places that might be a little icy and that seems pretty dangerous. So how, how have you dealt with that? You don't run so, in like cleats or something. <laughs> there are products out there that um, are called micro spikes and they go on your shoes and they basically will turn any shoe into 
like a metal cleat sort of. Oh, okay. Um, I don't actually have any of those. I've never run with them. Um, when I have run in areas that are icy, I do my best to avoid the ice, um, which means that like I do a lot of uh, dodging and weaving right, <laughs> on the right. trail I... or on the road. Yeah, or just, you know, kind of gingerly walking around it. <laughs> um, I haven't tried to train in an area where it's just like perma ice, constant ice. Uh, the areas that I've been running have been, you know, like a patch here and there or like a section of trail that doesn't see the sun. Um, and so it's easy enough for me to just keep my normal shoes and work around it rather than, you know, if you're going to be in an area that is just the road is ice and there's nothing you can do about it. Right. Get the micro spikes and try and run in those, but you don't want to run in micro spikes on not ice because then you'll ruin your spikes. But like, for me, there's no point in having them because I don't run in an area where I need them that much. Yeah. Where you are now in like Southern Arizona, do you, do, do you get much ice there? Not ice. We do get really cold temperatures, okay. um, which that's a is whole its other own, thing. Of, yeah. Yeah. Like running in the winter uh, is more than just dealing with the ice, right? It's dealing with cold air, cold body, cold extremities, cold hands, um, and like knowing how to layer. And so that is another one of those experiments that you get the opportunity to work through. Um, I find that my hands get very, very cold, but my body warms up like super fast. And I've run with some partners over the years, some running partners who, whose bodies don't warm up. And if it's, mm. if we're running in 18 degrees, like I'll warm up in like a quarter of a mile and I'll be like, Oh man, I don't need all these layers on and I'll be shedding. And they're like in their hoodies and in their puffy jackets running and freezing. And so like some bodies like mine warm up and some bodies don't warm up. And so you need to know that about yourself and then dress accordingly. These days in Southern Arizona, winter is not wet. Like we don't get snow necessarily. We don't get ice. We'll get rain on occasion, but we do get cold temperatures. And so usually what I wear these days is, you know, my running leggings, my legs are fine. They don't get cold. They got, they got muscles keeping them warm and they're doing a lot of work. My upper half uh, I'll have a tank top on. I've got some compression sleeves that I wear so that I can like easily take them off and peel them without having to like take a whole shirt off. Um, Cause I'm always still wearing my vest. So if I'm going to have to take a shirt off, I'm going to have to stop, take my vest off, take the shirt off, deal with the shirt, put the vest back on. So I wear these sleeves that come up to the top of my bicep um, just below my shoulder. And then that gives me a lot more like airflow so I'm not as like gross and sweaty um but then I can like peel them off really easily and shove them in a pocket on my vest and then I also will wear um these like glove mitten things that I made for myself fucking 12 years ago um and I always cover up my ears because if my ears get cold I will get a headache so ears are the most important thing to me to keep warm <laughs> what about your nose my nose is fine your nose is fine Okay. I don't have an issue with my nose. Okay. Cause I could totally like picture like my nose getting really cold, but then like you can't like cover it up because you're trying to breathe. And okay. I'm glad yeah. your nose is fine. I think if it's my nose is fine. Um, I was but, concerned you know, we about can make nose. you like, we can make you like a little beak or something to wear. And then <laughs> you just have to mouth breathe. Oh, the time, no. Which you I should just, be doing I, when you're running anyway. No, I, I, yeah, I just won't run. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> the solution is I just won't run. <laughs> I think that's fine. Um, and again, it's just like figuring out what works for you. I find that my hands are cold and so I want to keep them warm. And then, and then at the longer I run, the warmer I get, the more I want to peel, but I want to make sure the peeling is easy. You know, it's just, yeah. it, it's an experiment constantly. So you, you initially, to, to recap some of this, you initially started running for all the wrong reasons to try to fit in with the, the cool knitting ladies uh, and it didn't pan out and or to try to, to match your dad and didn't, didn't really pan out. And so you didn't run for a long time. Then you started running be, because you wanted an activity that you could do just with yourself uh, that would have at least a low entry point. 
And yeah. now two years in, what, what do you find you get out of running and what, what keeps you going and what motivated you to decide to sign up for this 50 K? Uh, cause I'm a masochist. Um, okay. That's what I thought. <laughs> I mean, it's Next really, it's just, you can't, yeah, you people, normal people don't sign up for things like this. Come on. Um, my, so when I started running two years ago, it was because I wanted an activity that I could do with low barrier to entry. And so my main goal for running was not mileage based. It was not speed based. I didn't have any physical goals for running when I started two years ago. My goal was to not hate it. That was the goal. And so low bar, <sighs> not really. <laughs> Yeah, that's my, fair. That's fair. Based on my previous experiences, <laughs> it was not a very low bar. And I mean, you don't run, so maybe it would not be a low bar for you either. Yeah. But <laughs> that was like the main goal was like, just learn how to not hate this because this is an activity that will benefit me physically. And so I just need to learn to fucking deal. Um, and so my main motivator for the first many months was just all right, got to go run. How are we going to make this enjoyable? And so that was taking off all of the pressure on reaching certain distances or going certain speeds. If I was pressuring myself or comparing myself, I wasn't going to enjoy it. So I was just trying to find ways to enjoy it. And sometimes that meant running with a partner and having like a fun conversation. And sometimes when I didn't have people to run with, it was listening to audiobooks or listening to podcasts and finding ways to enjoy it that way, just learning how to not hate it. Um, and then the more I did it and the more uh, I started paying attention to how I was feeling, I realized that, oh, hey, at the three mile mark, I feel pretty good. If I run less than three miles, I feel like shit and there's no point. <laughs> I don't get the endorphins. I don't get the feel goods. Like I don't get any of that stuff. Um, so then I was like, okay, cool. I will just only run three miles or more. Like I will not run less than three miles. Once I realized that that felt good, I started doing that. Okay, cool. And so then when you start running that and like living in the van and being out in the woods or in the desert or wherever I happen to be, I was running like trails or I was exploring forest roads. And then I would you know, find a little bit more enjoyment, like, oh, it's around that corner. What's over that hill? And then I, I would gradually increase my distance because I was curious, because I wanted to see what was coming next, because that was enjoyable. It was pretty, it was motivating. And then I started like enjoying it more, which was kind of the goal. <laughs> and then once you start enjoying it more, then you want to do it more and then you do it more and then you enjoy it more. And then when you enjoy it more, you want to do it more. And it's just, kind of stacks on itself and uh and then yeah I don't I mean that's just kind of how it went and I was like well if, if a little is good a lot is going to be better right if I enjoy running three miles then maybe I'll enjoy four or five or six or 30 30 <laughs> yeah yeah we're not quite there yet but uh yeah. I feel like we're getting there and like it's almost exactly two months from now is when the race is and so I feel like I alternate between like, I'm excited. I could do this. And like, holy shit, what have I done to myself? So. <laughs> I, think, I think we're going to need to have a uh, special update episode on the pot, on the Patreon. Uh, how did it go? Yeah. After how did the it go? Fact? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I would be game to hop on and do like a little Q and a live stream or whatever. Yeah. Be that'd be, to, that'd be, that'd be fun. No more. <laughs> But I, I don't know. Does that satisfactory answer I think, your question? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I mean, it's it's n not an experience that I personally feel like I can relate to all that much. But uh, but I get it. I get it mostly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, are there other activities that you've done where you're just like the more you do them, the more you're like, oh, I I do like this. What a surprise! I didn't know that. Hell, there are, but we're not going to talk about them here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
but so it's uh, like that <laughs> yeah yeah only okay. more fit for public consumption <laughs> 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 All right, that's fair. That's fair. Now I can relate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Here to help. All right. Uh, so, do you have anything else that you want to share on running? Anything on your running journey? Anything that, that we haven't touched on? Yeah. Um, I do get people saying things like, "How do you get started?" or or people will meet me now and or they'll hear you know, this podcast now and be like, oh man, she's, she's training for a 50 K. Like that's wild. I could never do that. Um, and like, that's not, that's obviously not where I started. I mean, if you're this far into the podcast, you know that that's not where I started. Um, so if, if running is something that you think you want to do, but it feels overwhelming or it feels like one of those things, like, well, if you're not going to do a marathon, like don't even try. And like, that is just a complete load of crap. Um, I started running because I wanted to have an activity that would serve me well, mentally and physically that I didn't hate that had a low barrier to entry. That's all I wanted. My goal was to not hate it. And so I would recommend if running is something that you think you might like possibly, but you're not sure how to get started, get yourself a cheap pair of running shoes and maybe a buddy or a podcast or whatever, and just go run for 10 minutes, you know, not even if you live in a neighborhood, like run to the end of one block, walk up the next block, run to the end of one block, walk down the next block and like circle back to your house. Keep it super short. Keep it super easy. Like no pressure, find ways to make it fun, find what you enjoy about it and maximize those things. Minimize the parts you don't enjoy. Like if I try to go fast, I'm going to hate everything. So I just don't even go fast. And I just accept the fact that I am a 10 to 12 minute runner. Like I am not a fast runner. I will, I'm not shooting to like win any races. I just want to finish them. Awesome. Sweet. Well, thank you. Yay. Yeah. I hope that, I think that this will be really helpful for people who are considering stepping in uh, just to kind of have a little bit more insight into what it may be like and to learn from some of your experiences with different types of equipment and different motivations for running. And yeah, I, I am excited to see how the next two months go as you finish your training for this, for this big one. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, and anybody who has, you know, any other questions, like let me know. I can answer them in a, in a future episode for the Patreon, or, you know, we can hop on a one-on-one -on -one coaching call or whatever. And I'm happy to help you work through your issues, but this is something that I'm still learning and I could talk about it forever. I also have an article that got published um, a few weeks ago uh, about mm. how to start trail running specifically. Um, so I can share that as well. Sweet. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you everybody who has listened in. We appreciate all of you so much. Uh, we invite you to uh, follow each of us on Instagram. We also have an Instagram account just for the podcast, as well as a Patreon. Uh, those are linked in the show notes. This is my first time kind of doing this, this part of the spiel, but uh, don't forget to give us the thumbs up and the five stars and all of those things that help us get seen. And yeah, let us know what you think. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Holly, for sharing awesome. about your journey. Thank you, Beers. And we will see you guys next week for another excellent episode. Bye. <laughs>